Personal Finance PowerPoint Presentation Decision to Buy Dental Insurance Prepare to get financially fit by practicing personal finance. Remember that insurance is part of our long-term risk mitigation strategy where we use the adage of measure twice, cut once, putting a formal plan in place, looking something like setting our insurance goals, developing a plan to reach the goals, putting the plan in action, reviewing the results, and repeating the process periodically. We're now going to be talking about dental insurance. Most of this information can be found at Investopedia, Guide to Dental Dental insurance, which you can find online. Take a look at the references, resources, continue your research from there. This is by Amy Fontenille, updated March 7th, 2022. Should I buy dental insurance? So in prior presentations, we've been looking at insurance in general, thinking about the concepts of insurance and the risk mitigation related to it. We then dived into the medical insurance, noting that the medical insurance can be more complicated due to the just the medical field in and of itself and do the policies related to the medical field and the insurance. Now we're going into the dental insurance, which is gonna be easier than the medical insurance, but still is a little bit different in nature than what you might think of as kind of standard insurance that you might get for say property insurance or life insurance or something like that, or liability insurance, where you're, you're usually safeguarding when you think about insurance against some future event that may be less likely to happen, but if it did happen, it would be financially devastating, such as getting sued for millions of dollars for liability insurance or property insurance or house burning down or something uh, like that. With the medical insurance, you have a similar kind of thing because you, you can have a big medical event where the insurance, which would cost you a lot of money, but they also kind of expanded it so that the insurance is also covering more routine medical procedures. On the dental insurance, that's a similar case. It's a little bit easier on the dental insurance oftentimes to, to categorize the different dental procedures. So therefore it could be easier to think about than the medical insurance, but you're even more often thinking uh, from the perspective of having the dental insurance cover kind of the routine maintenance on the dental uh, type of thing and possibly not using it so much or using it in conjunction with self-insurance to try to cover you know the big event if you have a really expensive dental thing that happened. Okay, should I buy dental insurance then is the question. There's no question that dental work is expensive, especially when you need to have major work done, which is why so many people eventually ask themselves, should I get dental insurance? So clearly you're saying, okay, I got medical insurance, I got my property insurance, liability insurance, the dental, it's kind of part of the medical and I could pay for my routine visits and whatnot, but do I need the added dental insurance and what is actually the purpose of the dental insurance? Is it gonna to try to help me to, pre to pay less for the preventative care or am I buying it to safeguard against a big bill that pops out of nowhere due to the fact that I got some weird dental problem that's gonna need fixing. So if you're not covered through your job, you may have to purchase it on your own. However, purchased ind individually, dental insurance can be a waste of money if your plan doesn't match your needs. Let's look at how to drill through these plans to find out if dental insurance is right for you. We're gonna drill through it, oh my goodness. Okay, so overview of dental insurance first. Here's a breakdown of how individual dental insurance works. You select a plan based on the provider's dentist uh, you want to be able to visit and what you can afford. So if you already have a dentist you like and they are in the insurance company's network, you'll be able to opt for one of these less expensive plans. So clearly you might first look at the dentist that you have and determine if you can get a plan that is around your dentist. Otherwise you might get the plan first and look for a dentist uh, that is in your area. So if you don't have a dentist at all, you can choose from any of the dentists who are in the network and again, have the option of a less expensive plan. If your existing dentist is not in the network, you can still get insured, but you'll pay significantly more to see an out of network provider. So if your doc dentist is not in the provider and you're going to them, then the insurance isn't going to help you out so much uh, with those day to day kind of routine maintenance uh, costs. The monthly premiums will depend on the insurance company, your location, and the plan that you choose. For many people, the monthly premium will be around $50 a month. This means that you'll spend $600 on dental costs each year even if you, if you don't get any work done. Is dental insurance worth it? 
Now you may think that most people don't come out ahead with most kinds of insurance, and you may be right. After all, if insurance companies don't make a profit, then they would all go out of business. So clearly, when you think about insurance, you might start to think, well, the insurance company needs to be making a profit, so how can it possibly be that it's a benefit to me if, if, if the cost that they're giving me, uh, somehow they're making a profit and they're paying for my dental costs, right? They must be making a profit. Therefore, you would think it would not be beneficial. Now, the traditional thought to that would be when you're looking at like liability insurance or property insurance would be, well, wait a second. No, you can have a large pool of people and you're talking about events that possibly are less likely to happen. But if they would happen, they're going to be financially devastating. So therefore, the fact that you're insuring against some big event that would be devastating to you, but that but that the insurance but the insurance can help you handle would make it possibly worthwhile. So the insurance company can make money by having a big pool of people that have a very low individual risk of something happening, but be fairly sure or fairly confident given the big pool of how often something happens so that they can make competitive premiums and still lower the risk to that individual who's safeguarding against some a big risk that can happen. You have a similar thing with the dental insurance, but the dental insurance being a little bit different because again, you're kind of designing your dental insurance around helping you to pay the, the maintenance kind of cost. So you still have that big pool kind of effect, but you're not really insuring against like one big or um, some low, uh, low probability, high, high cost thing that can happen. You're also kind of dealing with the routine kind of maintenance, but you got the similar kind of thing where you got this pool of people that they can get some idea based on the full pool to get competitive insurance prices that could be advantageous to an individual. So insurance is designed to protect you in a worst case scenario. Dental insurance is significantly different from most other kinds of insurances, however. So, and that's the case that we want to kind of wrap our mind around because it's called insurance here but you got a little bit of a different structure. With health insurance or homeowner's insurance, for example, the potential downside is so high that almost no one can afford the risk of not being insured. So again, in that case, it makes sense because to me, if that event happened, my house burnt down, it would be financially devastating. So even though the risk of it happening is low, it's often worth having the insurance uh, in that case. With dental insurance, the potential downside is fairly low, as is the potential upside. So you got a different dynamic here, because if you got a big medical event, and I believe part of this is due to if you had a big kind of a uh, medical event, it was surgery or something like that, then you might be categorizing it different than the normal kind of wear and tear on uh, the dental kind of things from, from lack of maintenance and dental and, and dental care and old age and that kind of stuff. So you might have this, this different inter, interplay. So it seems that then the insurance on the dental side is often focused to actual kind of lower the, the costs that you're paying for the more routine type of stuff rather than that big event like the home burning down. In a good year when you only need uh, the standard cleaning exams and x-rays uh, that make up good preventative care, you could lose money by having dental insurance. For example, if you paid out of pocket for these services, you might spend around $400 for the year, whereas you might spend $600 for the year on insurance premiums. So in that case, again, you might be saying, well, I'm paying the premiums, I'm getting the preventative care. If I pay $600, then, then I, the, I, the premiums or for the preventative stuff might be fully covered and I could have paid basically $400 simply out of pocket. In my mind, if you were also paying for the, the, the big event that possibly could happen, then that might make it, uh, that might make it more worth it. But if the insurance itself is really designed to simply cover the more maintenance kind of stuff, then this, this interplay between these variables could be could be more significant. So obviously, if you have a bad year, then you know the bills are going to go up. But you've got this cap on the insurance in terms of how much the insurance is going to pay. That's fairly low still. So it's kind of an interesting interplay. So older adults represent a group that may find it worthwhile to enroll in a dental insurance plan. Dental insurance for seniors is similar to plans for other individuals, but focuses on the types of coverage that seniors need. So these include crowns, root canals. Uh, dentures and tooth replacements. So obviously these items are going to be more costly. They're not the normal preventative 
uh, kind of stuff. And, and so therefore the dental insurance, if you're gonna have that going on more often, which is top possibly the case, if you're older, then it might be more worthwhile for the insurance is, is gonna come out ahead to actually pay the insurance possibly in those cases. Notice that even as we get older, the kind of things that you're gonna have done possibly just in terms of old wear and tear and not taking care of maintenance of the teeth, crowns, root canal, dentures, and so on. These are things that can be fairly well predicted as opposed to, like I say, other medical conditions. When we get old, in terms of our more old medical conditions, we, we often just don't know what's wrong. We're like, something's wrong. I don't, I don't know, we're going to specialists all over. I don't know how to categorize exactly. And that's gonna be one of the factors that kind of complicates the medical insurance as opposed to something that should be a little bit easier, hopefully, for the dental. So even though these coverages are not uh, unique to older individuals, there is a higher probability that seniors will need one or more of these procedures. Note that seniors on Medicare may require a different dental insurance plan than those without it. Will it be there when you need it? That's the question. So the question to me oftentimes would be, okay, well, if I'm covering the cleaning, and I'm paying more for the insurance than I would just to cover the cleaning. Well, if the insurance is going to kick in in the event that I have to have a crown or some more expensive thing, then it may be that that's when it would be more worthwhile because that's when it would be acting more like a normal insurance covering the bigger cost kind of risk. But with some of these normal procedures also, you might be able to self-insure a lot more effectively, meaning save up and have your own kind of insurance that would cover those things uh, more so than with the medical, because on the medical side of things, you can clearly have that big giant bill that can come up with sickness that's, that's going to be catastrophic, similar to if your home burnt down or something like that. You, just, you can't really cover your $500,000 home burning down uh, too easily. You can't really self-insure against that as easily. So then the question is, you know, how high could the cost basically be? Could I self-insure? What's the cap on the dental insurance in terms of how much they would pay if I had a high cost thing versus the high cost thing. So what about when you need uh, some work done? In a really bad year, your dentist could inform you that you need a couple of fillings, a root canal, and a crown. No, please, dear, no. On top of that, you'll still have to pay for your usual cleaning, exams, and x-rays. This is the time to be insured, right? That depends. <laughs> the annual maximum. So now you got the maximums coming in. And this is a little bit different than the medical insurance. You still got the deductibles, the co-pays, and so on. But uh, with the medical insurance, you got that thing that's, that's the out-of-pocket maximums where the medical insurance kicks in after you pay so much and you know the medical insurance kind of kicks in whereas the dental insurance has the maximum that the insurance company will pay which is kind of low uh you would think so unfortunately your insurance may not uh be as as helpful as you would expect some dental insurance plans have low annual maximums around one thousand dollars this will vary by plan and provider of of course so one thousand dollars you know i can i if that's the cost that it was going to be, I can kind of self-insure against that. But that's per year. So you got multiple years that that can happen. But if you go over that, then, you know, then you're, you're paying for it. So that's kind of an interesting thing because, again, it's a little different than what you would expect for oftentimes for more in other insurance. Once your dental bill exceeds $1,000 in any given year, you're stuck paying the rest of the bills in full. Uh, the insurer won't pay for more than $1,000 in treatment. That on top of the fact that they don't, they might not pay for the cosmetic stuff, which oftentimes people are going to go in for like the whitening and just, you know, whatever veneers or something like that uh, is kind of disappointing to some degree. So you may still pay a lower uh, negotiated fee for the work that you need as a benefit of having insurance, but even negotiating fees could be quite high. So for example, if the dentist's regular fee for a filling is $150, then the negotiated fee might be $100. In this situation, your regular oral maintenance and fillings could use up most or all of your annual maximum, so only a fraction of your, uh, of your larger dental work bill might actually be covered. You might still pay $1,000 to $2,000 out of pocket plus your annual $600 in premiums. So the coinsurance costs. On top of that, uh, while you may pay 0%, in coinsurance on preventative maintenance and 20% on fillings, root canals, and extractions, the policyholder's share of expensive procedures such as crowns, bridges, 
implements tends to be a whopping 50%. So you've got the same, same kind of dynamic we saw with the medical insurance with the with the deductible, but then the coinsurance and, and so on. But those coinsurances, meaning you pay for part of it, can be fairly high when you start talking about the fairly high cost stuff. So this is known uh, in the industry as the 180-50 coverage structure. Even if you haven't used up your annual maximum by the time you need the expensive procedure, you'll still have to pay several hundred dollars for it. What's not covered? Dental insurance also rarely covers expensive procedures such as uh, orthodontics and cosmetic dentistry. So again, those kind of things, it's kind of interesting. It's, it can be disappointing because some of those kind of cosmetic things that are falling under cosmetic uh, or orthodontics, obviously the orthodontic stuff can be something that is kind of necessary. <laughs> and the cosmetic stuff more and more these days, some of it might be more preventative uh, as well, but it's going to be falling under the, the category of cosmetic. So even if you try to argue uh, that you need a procedure to alleviate emotional pain and suffering, so they're not taking into consider the emotional pain to say that it's necessary. So and I can kind of get that. But still, you would think it'd still be preventative. Some of this stuff uh, might be preventative. In case, but in any case, so when insurance does uh, does cover them, the annual maximum still often prevent you from saving very much, if anything, after you factor in your biannual cleaning and exams. Waiting won't work. If you think that you'll just hold out and purchase dental insurance when you need it, think again. And this is something that you want to be aware of because when you buy insurance, you might think, now wait a second, does it make any sense that I can buy insurance right before I know that I need like a root canal or a crown or something or that I'm walking around, you know, husking my holding my jaw constantly. So I know I have a pre-existing condition, you might call it in the medical industry. If I buy insurance and then the next day I go in, wouldn't the insurance company be upset with that? Well, what they're, they're not going to try to screen you for pre-existing conditions to, to figure that out, but they might put you on a holding period so the insurance won't kick in for certain procedures until after that time frame. And, uh, and so that's what you gotta, you got to be aware of uh, for that. So because of, it, because of what's called a waiting or probationary period, this strategy won't work. You didn't really think that you had found a way to outsmart the insurance companies, did you? So waiting periods mean that, for example, one year after you first become insured, your insurance will not cover any major work, such as crowns or root canals. And for three months after you first become insured, you won't pay for any minor work, such as fillings. So waiting periods vary by policy. So in other words, you're saying, I'm in pain. I'm going to buy insurance so that it'll cover my this big thing that I know is going to happen because I have my mouth hurts. Well, you can't, they're going to say, no, you're going to buy the, it seems kind of cruel, but you'll buy the coverage and then they'll say, yeah, we'll clean your, we'll give you a cleaning, but uh, we're not going to be able to do anything else with the insurance for, you know, a year or something like that. Well, that's not going to happen if you're in, in pain. So, so that's how they kind of take care of that pre-existing condition kind of thing. So in any case, insurance companies know that when you need a filling or a crown, you need it now. You won't be able to find out that you need a crown, buy insurance, wait 12 months, and then get it taken care of. So you're not, you're not going to be able to say, if I'm in pain, I'm not, you're not going to be able to wait 12 months after you purchase the insurance. That's going to be the problem. So, and, and that's the point of, obviously, the insurance's point is that you're supposed to get insured before you have the problem. That's what they're that's what they're trying to do. That's why they've got this debate with the pre-existing conditions with the medical insurance and that kind of thing. Obviously, you know, if you buy an insurance after you have the problem, then that defeats the whole calculation of the insurance. So the dental is going to try to get around that by not dealing with the pre-existing condition, but just saying we're not going to cover certain things until you've been insured for a certain amount of time, which is a little sneaky but I can see why they do that. So if you tried to do that, you would probably suffer from a lot of discomfort and ultimately you lose your tooth and have to pay full price for that extraction. So considerations for group plans. Surprisingly, even if your employer offers dental insurance, you might be better off skipping it, which again, this is, seems kind of unusual because again, you would think that I want to be insured against I have a big, a big kind of dental problem, but the way the dental insurance is structured is a little bit different than other kinds of insurance. So many people assume that employer-sponsored benefits are automatically a good deal because you're receiving a group rate, but this isn't necessarily the case. 
So typically when you, when you think about insurance in general, you would think, well, if you get the group rate, that's usually better than buying it on your own. When evaluating your employer's dental plan, make sure to examine the monthly payments, the annual maximum, and the co-insurance. Your employer may offer you a great plan that's only $20 a month to cover your entire family with a generous annual maximum or a, a mediocre plan that's $50 uh, a month worth a $1,000 uh, annual maximum. With the former, you can really benefit, uh, but with the latter, you could be wasting your money. So in other words, it clearly depends on the employer. They could have a really good plan that's going to be setting, that, that'll be set up, but they could have a fairly cheap plan that would be through the group policy. The medical plans can vary quite a bit. So do the math for your own situation to determine whether you're likely to come out ahead. One situation where it can make sense to get dental insurance regardless of whether it seems like a good deal in the long run is if you are, are living from paycheck to paycheck with little or no money saved. So in that case, you're not going to be able to self-insure as easily. So a fairly modest dental bill could still be fairly significant. That means, you know, that one to two thousand dollar dental bill or even that maximum, you know, could could be something that could be quite painful <laughs> if you're living paycheck to paycheck. So it might be worthwhile to pay for the insurance to guard against that. So when you don't have dental insurance, you have to be able to pay a one thousand six hundred dollar bill when you have the work done. If not in full then in prompt installments if you can't do it and your options are to overpay for dental insurance neglect your only set of teeth or put dental work on a credit card uh, that you'll have trouble paying off then your best bet is to get the insurance you'll probably waste less money on insurance than you would paying interest on a credit card or letting your dental health deteriorate so what's the bottom line the bottom line is a horizontal kind of signal that we put underneath the last piece of text here and this is it so if you can't participate in a quality group dental plan either a preferred provider plan ppo or a dental health maintenance organization the dhmo then the best way to come out ahead on dental expenses may be to pay for everything out of pocket uh, brushing and flossing regularly, switching to an inexpensive electric uh, toothbrush, getting professional cleanings every six months, and going to a dentist who does high quality work that lasts for years can be the most effective ways to save money in the long run.